contribution. And there is some time after our session for some discussion if you folks or your chair. would like to continue to chat and absolutely encourage that. Mm -hmm. um, so before we start, I uh, want you to know that we are recording this session. Um, if you feel uncomfortable with your thumbnail video appearing on the recording, please turn off your video now. And please mute your audio or I may mute it for you. But please turn on the chat function. For those who don't know how, you can hover your cursor over the bottom of the Zoom screen. The chat button will appear and just click on it. Or you might find something on your screen that looks like a speech bubble. Good evening and welcome to Broadview's National Online Reading Club. My name is Emma Prestwich and I'm Broadview's digital editor. Sharon Doran, Broadview's promotions manager, is helping me out behind the scenes. We're so glad that you've taken some time out of your evening to be here with us. We'd love to know who you are and where you're from. So if you haven't already, please say hi from your hometown in the chat space. This evening we'll be featuring three fascinating and thoughtful people. Interview subject Michael Blair and writers Miranda Newman and Gillian Stewart. But just, just a few more notes before we begin. After our speakers have told us a bit about themselves and their stories, please be brave and ask questions. We know from our reading club surveys that you wanna hear questions and comments from each other and not just from the host. So if there's something you wanna say, please go for it. There are two ways to ask a question. You can type, I have a question into the chat and I'll call on you as time allows. Then switch on your audio and ask your question. Or you can just type it into the chat and I can ask it for you. That's about it. Our first guest is Michael Blair. Michael Blair is the new General Secretary of the United Church of Canada, the denomination's top administrator. He began working at the Church's General Council Office as the Executive Minister for the Ethnic Ministries Unit, and more recently as Executive Minister for the Church and Mission Unit. In our January-February issue, Christopher White interviewed Michael about his call to ministry and where he thinks the United Church should go from here. We'll speak to him more about his vision for the future of the Church. Please join me in welcoming Michael. Uh, thanks, Emma, and uh, good evening. The 39th uh, General Council of the United Church uh, meeting in Thunder Bay in August of 2006 ended with a call and an affirmation of the church. The call was an invitation to respond to the question, what purpose lies at the heart of the United Church of Canada in the beginning of its third generation? And it ended with a prayer. One of the phrases in that prayer was, God, lead us into your future, rooted in the richness of our past. The conversation I had uh, with Chris uh, was based on, on those two particular themes. And um, I think the title of the article in terms of uh, God leading the United Church in its future is where that comes from. But those, that is a uh, fairly uh, critical um, piece for me in terms of my role in the church. At that particular general council in Thunder Bay, the church approved the appointment of a new general secretary, the first lay woman who was not formally theologically trained. As well, the church made a number of commitments to become an intercultural church, to deepen its work of building right relationship with the indigenous peoples, and to continue the work of em emerging spirit. It is against this background of risk taking that I offered my reflection as the new general secretary. In the conversation, I shared my opinion and views about the present opportunities and challenges for the church as a way of introducing myself. So in the interview, I talk about my call. I talk about my experiences, a young uh, teenager in uh, the Pentecostal tradition I grew up in in the church and my, the opportunity I had to lead worship and uh, the encouragement I had 
from my uh, pastor, which has was for me one of those key moments for thinking about uh, ministry in the future. In many ways, it is a personal story. My call, my experience of um, my work in the church, my understanding of what's happening in congregations, and my sense in terms of the role of the General Secretary and the future of the United Church. A not so obvious tension in the story is the understanding of the role of the General Secretary and the question of how my personal views and vision shapes the institution when the polity requires that the role of the General Secretary is to be administrative. One thing I've often said about myself is that I enjoy trying to expand people's imagination. So I've been very appreciative of some of the conversations on social media in response to the, art, the article. And especially the piece in the article that talked about uh, culture um, eating strategy for breakfast um, every time and the piece around the need for transformation. The lectionary reading for this uh, coming week is based on the, calls, the call of the disciples. In particular, the conversation between Andrew and Nathaniel and Nathaniel and Jesus. And that is a reminder for me of the importance of transformation. That transformation is based on relationship, trust, and risk. And as I think of the church and its future, I would continue to um, maintain that all three are critical, relationship, trust, and risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. <clears throat> the first question I have for you was something that you mentioned in one of your answers. You said that the church has missed engaging with the gospel as a transformational experience. Can you expand on that? So again, just to, to think about the text for, for the upcoming um, Sunday on the call of the disciples. And as I was uh, reflecting on that this morning, a recognition that when, um, when folks in the scripture experienced Jesus, there was a transformation of their lives. Some of the stories, we know the end of it. Some of them we don't know, but we know something happened. You know, the story, for example, of the woman um, at the well in John chapter 4, that her encounter of Jesus um, enabled her to go back to a community which perceptionally it seems like she was ostracized from and was embraced back by that community. Something happens in our relationship with Jesus that transforms us. We can't be the same when we encounter Jesus. And that encounter in allows us to then to say to others, come see. And I think the church has missed out. I think in many ways, we have the kind of faith that is cerebral, but not about transformation in terms of actually making a critical difference in our lives. And the fact that even our engagement in social justice is not simply because we are people who believe in the Christianization of the, the social order, but we're people who cannot help but engage in justice because of our experience of Jesus. Thank you. There's a question from Pam. Pam, feel free to ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I believe that the United Church of Canada is going to die in the next generation unless we start using non-theistic language more in our liturgy and hymns. Uh, I get the impression that ministers are afraid to do it. They fear for their job, as we saw what happened with Greta Vosper. Uh, do you see the United Church being able to encourage and support our ministers to be braver in that area in the near future? 
So uh, in my role as general secretary, that's really <laughs> not my responsibility in some ways. But I, but it, I think it's tied in with this notion of the transfer, transforming power that every encounter that I read in scripture of people encountering Jesus, something happens, that there's a mystery there. And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we um, pass over the notion that there is mystery, whether that mystery is, is, is shaped in theistic language. But it's, I think it's important because the question is, what is it? that is different for us as followers of Jesus, as opposed to other kind of social networks. I don't, I'm not quite answering your question and you can see I'm dancing around it, but I, but I think for me, the question is not whether we adopt theistic language or non-theistic language. The, the question is, do we, um, as people of faith, recognize that there is something about our engagement with the Jesus who is revealed in, in the scripture. And it can't be simply about social change. It's about personal transformation and engagement. Anton has a question. He's wondering if you can explain the relationship between relationships, trust, and especially risk. So I think it's important to recognize that we are relational beings and that we, um, we're called to be in relationship with, with each other. So if I can, if I can take a, a page out of um, uh, another experience. So as a, as a, a man of color, and um, particularly given the conversation since George Floyd's death, I think one of the challenges that we've discovered is that we, most of us have very cursory, if, if not any relationship with, um, with people of color. So we lack the relationship with um, communities of color. And because we lack those relationships, we don't have the trust of people in that, that community and therefore we don't know how to risk. And I think in some ways to build a relationship which becomes a relationship of trust allows us to risk together to uh, bring about the transformation of our, our, our societies. Again, if you take a page from um, the Indigenous Church as part of the United Church of Canada, you know, the, the United Church of Canada has offered formally two apologies to the Indigenous communities. It's been over 30 years since the first apology was offered. It has not yet been accepted by our indigenous communities. They've acknowledged that we have apologized, but they have not accepted it. And one of the things that they've said to us is, in, in many ways, is that we'll, we'll, we'll come to the point of being able to accept it out of relationship. And so um, it's that kind of uh, connection, building relationships, seeing people uh, in the fullness of their humanity, building a level of trust, and then we can risk crossing barriers, boundaries, bridges, and um, actually become instruments of transformation in the world. So I think that for me, those three are part of it. If there's no relationship, there's no trust, and the ability to risk is very low. Bill has a question. He's wondering, with severe budget constraints, how will we maintain any national justice political presence? National justice or political presence? <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. I, I think in some ways, um, we don't have a, a financial problem. Um, we have a, 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 a mission problem. And I think in some ways, um, the, the reality, and, I, and to come back to this intersection between um, you know, relationship, trust, and risk, um, the, the, the challenge for us is that w because we don't have the relationship and we don't have the trust, we don't really understand the fact that we, um, being active 
in advocating for justice is 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 a problem. So again, if I can illustrate it out with the um, the people of African descent, sixty one percent of um, people of African descent in Canada are at risk of some kind of psychosis. And part of that is just this the stress of racism is one of that and the compounding nature of racism in terms of uh, what it means for um, employment, what it means for security, what it means for peace of mind. Because we don't have the relationship, we don't know that and, and somehow we don't engage in kind of the social, social systems that, that challenges that. A, a quick example, when I worked in Regent Park um, a few years back, one of the programs that got developed in Regent Park was a program called Pathways to Education. Pathways to Education program guaranteed a $1,000 a year for every student who completed high school. When the first cohort um, completed high school, we discovered that um, if we were to give that money to the students for their post-secondary edu education, their parents uh, rents would go up because they were living in rent geared to income. And, and that, um, that amount of money given to them would be seen as family income and would increase their rents. So here was a some, uh, situation that was put in place to break the cycle of poverty, <laughs> but even the solution created issues around that. And we recognized that the only way we could do that was to advocate for changes in how the social housing and family incomes get. So I think out of that relationship, out of the trust, we begin to understand that our engagement in justice is not a choice. Um, and it's not something that's dependent <laughs> upon our financial resources, but it's something about our call. So I think for me, part of, the, part of it is to invite us again to rediscover um, our call as the people of God, and in that engagement of call, I think the resources will be there for us to engage the justice work that God calls us to do, which is we have no we have no excuse in 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 not in doing it. Ellen Bill, I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> Helen has a question. Go ahead, Helen. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, Michael, I, in your introduction, I heard you mention the phrase emerging spirit. Yeah. And I wonder if you would please, I haven't heard that term for several years now, and I wonder if you would please um, enhance your remarks. So I was saying that in the context of the General Council in, in 2006, um, the church uh, agreed to continue its um, a program called um, Emergent Spirit. And if you remember, if you're a United Church person, you remember that for a number of years, the church invested a significant amount of its resources in, in attempting to uh, imagine ways in which it could become attractive to folks who weren't in the pews. And so we did a lot of work around how to become welcoming communities. We did a lot of uh, um, stuff in the press on social media, um, advertisement and that kind of stuff. I, I think in some ways um, that was a learning time for us. We, we learned a lot about that kind of process. And in recent days, the church has moved to um, embracing the spirit, which is another project of, in some ways in the, in the lineage of um, uh, emergent spirit, but of finding new ways to to engage in ministry. And in some ways, we've talked about it as a bit of a skunk work in the sense that we're going to uh, explore all the possibilities of seeing what new forms of ministry may look like, recognizing that the model of the box, the preacher and the book is is in decline are there other ways to engage people in spiritual formation and, and spiritual life so um you know um emergent spirit was an experiment um 
And it was an experiment in which we learned and then we've morphed into embracing the spirit. We have time for one more question. It's from Susan. Susan's wondering, in your interview, you said that the church needs to help people articulate their faith. How can the United Church help them do that? So <laughs> in a number of ways, and I think um, uh, part of that is, is ministry personnel, part of that is staff in the regions, part of it is our collected effort at, at helping us articulate why is it that we um, believe what we believe and why is it that we want to be followers of Jesus. Um, you know, again, when I read a book, if I'm uh, excited about that book, I'm going to want <laughs> people who are in my, in my world to know about the book and I'm going to suggest it to them and I'm going to say, I read this amazing book um, you should ex you should read it too. Or if I um, see a movie, I'm going to speak about the movie. I think in some ways we we're intimidated and in talking about our faith, and so I think part of the challenge uh, of the church is to help us again learn the faith, and help us to find the confidence to speak. Um, if it's important to you then it should be important to, to friends and how you begin to articulate that is important. So to learn the stories again, um, we're well steeped in terms of our, our tradition of worship um, in the lectionary, but somehow to kind of delve deeper into the, the, the story of the text and how it is that we encounter the divine in that experience. And, and what difference it makes. Again, it's back to where I started. The woman at the well um, encounters Jesus at the well. She goes to a community and says, come see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? But the whole uh, community comes out uh, with her to encounter Jesus. And the irony of the text is, we believe not because you told us, but we believe because we've experienced it ourselves. And so I think that's, part of that helping folks understand the story rediscovering jesus in fresh and new ways experiencing that transformation and to be able to tell people about what's actually going on in their lives i think we have another question and another comment or two there will be some time at the end of our session at eight to continue this discussion so please uh, feel free to continue chatting then Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. We're now gonna move on to our second guest, Miranda Newman. Miranda is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in the Literary Review of Canada, The Walrus, and more. She volunteers for the Toronto Cat Rescue in her spare time. For our January-February issue, Miranda wrote Kids in Crisis about her struggle with untreated mental illness as a child and how early intervention could help other young people moving forward. She looked at the myriad barriers that prevent children's trauma and mental health issues from being recognized. Please join me in welcoming Miranda. Thanks so much, Emma. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Before I start, I'd just like to deliver a content warning. Um, I will be talking about suicide, specifically suicide in children over the next five minutes. So if listening would be unhealthy or damaging to you in any way, and you'd like to wander away until I'm done, I won't be offended. Please take a moment to do so. Um, you know, I think it's most important to take care of yourself right now. So I'll give people just a second if they want to wander away or mute me, it's no problem. Um, otherwise, I'll begin. So Jalen, Amal, Alyssa, Arca, Chaz, Janera, Jolyn, Chantel. These are the names of a few of the 652 children under 14 years old who died by suicide in Canada between 2000 and 2018. Six of those 652 children were under the age of nine. Through my feature, Kids in Crisis, in the January-February edition of Broadview, I sought to better understand why Canadian children were struggling with suicide and what could be done to help them. 
I learned that children more likely to attempt suicide are those with adverse childhood experiences, um, like being in an abusive situation, uh, experiencing the death of a caregiver, neglect, basically situations that create an unbearable need to escape. Um, through my research, I determined that until our mental health care system puts an emphasis on prevention and early intervention uh, until we're able to address structural inequities within a child's environment, children in Canada with mental health issues are going to be left dealing with the consequences alone. Um, I realize suicide in children is a topic most people would prefer uh, not to think about, but it's a story that I've been carrying with me personally for a long time. At six years old, as I detail in my piece, I made my first suicide attempt, though I had always imagined I would one day write about my childhood experience with suicide. I had initially pitched my editor at Broadview, uh, Christy Woodstra, a, a story about mental health readmissions in Canada. I came to Christy and Broadview with this idea because of the level of consideration and care they demonstrated when I wrote a feature about growing up with my stepdad, a man who struggled with opioid addiction for the September 2019 issue of Broadview. Christy spotted the potential in my pitch and asked me to reorient it toward child suicide. Um, I didn't really know at the time if I was professionally capable of telling it, but um, I'm super thankful for Christie's encouragement as this is such an important issue and it's one I hope I've done justice to. Um, I'm also exceedingly grateful to everyone who shared their time and insights with me for this piece, but especially to Dorothy Angus. Dorothy is the mother of Jalen Angus who died by suicide on November 21st, 2019 at the age of 10. It took a lot of bravery and emotional and mental fortitude um, to be able to speak about what happened to her daughter and her family with me. So I just wanna thank and honor her for sharing. Um, shortly after we connected, Dorothy and I, the governments of Canada and Saskatchewan where Jalen lived with her family on reserve signed a letter of commitment with the Federation of Sovereign Nations promising to make addressing suicide among Indigenous youth a priority. On November 21st, 2020, Dorothy and her family marked the anniversary of Jalen's death with a feast. The family had planned to do a large fundraiser so they're able to continue to memorialize her on the anniversary of her passing for four years according to their customs, but that was canceled due to COVID-19. As a result of COVID-19 putting so much pressure on the healthcare system and the mental and emotional impacts of lockdowns, not to mention the lack of safety nets like schools that might catch early signs of mental health concerns in children, I don't actually expect we're any closer to resolving this issue than when I started writing the piece which is super frustrating, um, especially when you consider the research to, be do, to do so has been out since the mid 90s. Um, that being said, writing this piece has sparked a, a personal change within me through writing about suicide while simultaneously being in therapy to sort out what I was discovering. I've been able to fundamentally change my relationship with my childhood suicide attempts. I've been able to let go of any parts of me that saw those actions as shameful or weak and really unburden myself. I can hold a lot more compassion for my girlish self who felt that was her only option. Um, you know, I can even love her, which is something I never thought I'd be able to do. My biggest hope with this piece though, is just that it gets into the hands of those that need it the most. Thank you so much for listening and for reading my story. If you did, um, if you like my work, you can find more about me on my website at mirandanewman.com. Thanks. Thank you so much, Miranda. I, it sounds like this piece definitely sparked a, a personal journey for you. Um, in the course of interviewing and researching and writing it, was there anything that surprised you from the interviewees that you spoke to, from the details that you, um, the details that you came on as you were working on the story? 
Absolutely. And I think you might even be able to tell that it surprised me in the story. Um, I spoke to Jeffrey Anslos, who's uh, this amazingly talented uh, psychiatrist researcher. I think he's the research chair for Indigenous Suicide right now. Um, I don't want to get his titles wrong, but he spoke to me. I've been in therapy on and off since I was 16 years old. And I think when you go through therapy when you have been in the system that long, you start to internalize this idea that there's something inherently wrong with you and that you, the onus is on you to fix it. And when I spoke with Jeffrey, he spoke about specifically as it relates to suicide in Indigenous populations, this idea that if the logics of the world aren't conducive to you thriving, if you live in a community where, you know, you don't have access to fresh water, you don't have access to clean drinking water, if, you know, society tells you that you are less than, then is being depressed, is having, you know, suicidal ideations really a disordered response or is it an ordered response to a disordered environment? And that was really eye-opening for me. Um, you know, I think especially as a person who's, who's been in the therapy world for so long to have it reoriented as an environmental issue as well as an individual issue. So that, that was really compelling to me. Absolutely. Many of our readers likely came away from this wishing that there was something that they could do. What what do you hope that readers take away from it? Um, I think there, there are two things that I would hope readers take away from it. Um, one being that if they do have any concerns about children in their life and their extended families, that they do research, that they look for warning signs. The Center for Suicide Prevention out in Calgary has some really wonderful information around uh, children's mental health, specifically as it relates to children and suicide, and they have some wonderful resources on their website about the warning signs to look for in a child. So if you do have concerns about a child, be proactive. Um, I think my second bit of things, like advice that I would like to, or story that I would like to share actually came from my grandmother. She read the piece, she is my stepdad's mother, and she, she, you know, she was pretty upset by it, but she called me to say specifically that you know, she was sorry because she knew there was something wrong the whole time, but it was easier for her not to interfere because if she interfered, she may not be able to see us anymore. And I guess my message is just that at times when it's easier not to interfere, just take a beat and consider the long-term impacts of what not interfering means. Question from Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, uh, thanks Miranda for uh, sharing a, a challenging story um, and, a, and an important one. Uh, you mentioned today and in the story, uh, teachers and, and the school system. Um, and it seems like a really important point of interaction given how much time a lot of children are spending in school and interacting with their teachers and their peers there. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, what the sort of school system and what teachers can do to be more supportive on, on this particular issue? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the challenges is, you know, we do have a very siloed system where healthcare and education are completely different ministries. And those two don't necessarily over, overlap very much. And even healthcare can be continually siloed because, you know, I get healthcare from the province, but an indigenous person who lives on reserve would get it from the federal government. So I think until we find a way to be able to sort of cross breach some of these silos that we've created in our ministries and by doing things like, you know, in teacher training, including courses for teachers to recognize traumatized children, to give them options about what they can do for traumatized children. But that takes, you know, a lot of huge institutions that grind very slowly to work together in a way that they don't work together right now. Um, that being said, I think individual teachers can definitely, can definitely, you know, take initiative and, and look for the education themselves, um, you know, and and educate themselves on what traumatized children look like, what you can do for traumatized children. But unfortunately, you know, I think until it's 
it's mandated almost at like a ministry level where teachers should receive some sort of training in recognizing children with trauma or children who are coming from adverse environments, you know, it's, it's going to be basically on an individual basis. I hope that kind of answers the question. You wrote about in the story, you wrote about a childhood visit to a doctor who dismissed the mental health issues you were struggling with as a food allergy. I'm wondering whether or not you think adults can be dismissive of children's mental health concerns and why. I absolutely think adults can be dismissive of children's mental health concerns. I mean, I think because children grow and develop so quickly, it's so easy to think of something as a phase, right? Like they're just going through a phase. It, it's just a phase, you know, they'll get over it. And in some cases, you know, that is what's happening. A child is going through a phase. Um, but, you know, I think, I think where you have to where you really have to, to be concerned is, is children who are afraid to communicate. Those are, are children that aren't going to have their health needs caught because they're, they're too afraid to even say what they're feeling. So it's not even a matter of being dismissed by, by the adults in their life. It's a matter of not only not having the communication tools to be able to tell them what's happening, but actually dealing with like a base level of fear where they might need a different environment to be able to open up with those concerns. You know, if a child is coming from a highly stressful, highly traumatized environment, and that child then goes to a, a doctor with the parent that, you know, is responsible for creating or half responsible for creating that, that, childhood, that childhood environment, like, of course, the child isn't going to be able to to properly articulate what's going on to them. And, you know, I do think that a lot of doctors, especially doctors, you know, who had, who had training 30, 40 years ago, um, are more likely to err on the side of, of caution. They don't want to assume that something that's happening in a child is mental illness. They want to look at all the other options first. Um, but I think that's another problem in healthcare right there is we tend to see the physical and mental as two separate entities. I've, I've gone off on a tangent. I apologize, Emma. No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to that. If you like, in the chat, if there are any resources that you can think of that would be helpful to share, please feel free to put them in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your story, both in the piece and here again with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Our final guest is Jillian Stewart. Jillian is a Calgary journalist. She writes a column for the Toronto Star and received the 2014 Atkinson Fellowship in Public Policy. She first wrote about the Stony Nakoda as a novice reporter at the Calgary Herald. In her piece, Monument to a Mission, she wrote about the effort to restore a historic Alberta United Church that burned down and differing perspectives on whether rebuilding represents an act of reconciliation or a move to reopen old wounds. Please welcome Jillian. Feel free to unmute Jillian. There we go. <laughs> I, I know how to do that. Why didn't I do that? Okay, I'll start over. <laughs> um, hello to everybody from Calgary, uh, especially uh, a lot of people I can't see, but especially to the people that I can. Um, my story, as Emma said, revolves around the rebuilding of a small historic church in southern Alberta and the impact of that rebuilding on the neighboring First Nation. Um, the history of the encounter between that First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, and the Methodist missionaries that came to this part of Alberta about 150 years ago is, is really fascinating. Uh, and, and I had to delve into a lot of that history for this piece. Um, at the time of the encounter, the, um, the Stony Nakoda were in perilous times. Uh, smallpox had already run through a lot of the indigenous groups in, in southern Alberta. Um, and the buffalo were on the point of disappearing. And as I'm sure all of you know, the buffalo was uh, 
an important food source. So these were not good times for, uh, for the indigenous people of this area. The Methodist missionaries who came in, uh, mostly the McDougall family, uh, they came 150 years ago, and they were a very hardy bunch, I have to say, and they were very brave. Uh, they were really in uh, the first European or uh, white settlers in, in this area. At the time, uh, there was the odd, you know, cattle driver or explorer or trapper or, uh, you know, people like that, but there really were no uh, European settlers. The majority of the people in the area were Indigenous people. And so it was an extraordinary time uh, for both, um, both those parties, right, to be encountering e each other at this particular time. So that's 150 years ago, but now we have this current situation, which I'm writing about, which is the rebuilding of a church that got burnt down. And looking at the current situation raised in me a lot of questions about the meaning of reconciliation. Um, what does it mean and what does, uh, you know, um, what kind of action does it require? Now, when it came to actually putting this story together, I did rely on a lot of my past experience, as Emma uh, mentioned. Uh, when I was a younger reporter, I actually um, covered um, Indigenous issues in Southern Alberta for the Calgary Herald. So I had some familiarity and some knowledge and some contacts actually on the First Nations reserves in Southern Alberta. And there's some very big reserves in Southern Alberta, as I'm sure some of you know. And it was a very interesting time actually when I first started um, covering these, these issues. So I wasn't starting from square one. I did, I did have some familiarity with these issues. And when I decided that I wanted to write this story, I thought that Broadview was actually the perfect vehicle, mainly because of Broadview's audience. I knew that the audience would be interested in this particular story. And I also knew that Broadview had very high journalistic standards, which was important to me. And when I actually pitched the story idea, um, the editors at Broadview quickly responded, which in the positive, which was very nice. Um, as I proceeded with the story, with the research and the interviews, it, be, it, it became much more complicated than I had um, anticipated at first. Uh, I had to meld together, uh, you know, a past and the present. Uh, I had to make a, you know, a narrative that included both, uh, but moved along, as they say, because, you know, it is, it's not a book, it's a, it's a magazine piece. So I had to, you know, concisely talk about the past, but also really make it clear how it was impacting what was happening in, around the rebuilding of the church. And the other thing about the story that I found really interesting is, and, and made me realize that it was much more complicated than I had anticipated, is there so, is all the different viewpoints, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's much more of a nuanced uh, story, I think, than clearly black and white. And, um, you know, I had to take that into account when I was writing the piece. I had to give everybody that contributed in terms of interviews the space that they needed um, to say their to say their piece and to accurately portray their intention um, when they spoke to me, so those were all things um, that were part and parcel of putting this story together. And as I said at the beginning, one for me, one of the things that um, I really learned and I came I had to come to terms with and think about was this idea of reconciliation. And given what we know now. What does it mean when we talk about reconciliation? I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, 150 years ago, um, you know, general Canadian society, whatever you thought that might be at the time, had different ideas and they thought they were right. Okay, um, I accept that. But what is it now that we know more about what happened to Indigenous people, what does reconciliation actually mean now in this day and age? So that was something that um, I had to think about when I wrote the story. So um, I'm interested in your questions for sure. Thank you, Jillian. I have a question first from L. Douglas Ray. We're wondering when you get, uh, could, should the United Church be taking positions 
on the removal of monuments and statues of specific historical figures? Well, that's a pretty touchy question these days. Um, you know, I have, to, I have to say some monuments uh, don't uh, actually celebrate things that maybe in this day and age should be celebrated. And I think we have to look at them um, one by one. And we also have to consider why, if we're building new monuments, why are we building them? What is the point? You know, and who are we actually celebrating? And does it make sense in this day and age to do that? You did a lot of historical research for this piece. Was there anything that struck you as particularly noteworthy? Oh, well, I, as I said at the beginning, I think that, you know, the, that those first years of the encounter between uh, the Stony Nakoda and uh, the Methodist missionaries, I think was an extraordinary time. Um, when you think about, um, you know, this vast land, and we're talking, and, and uh, about the Stony Nakoda who live on just on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, you know, a beautiful part of the world, uh, but very rugged and that's where they lived and, and hunted and, and brought up their families. Uh, their encounter then with Methodist missionaries who had a very different uh, view of the world. I mean, it's clear that when the Methodist missionaries came, they came with the intent of civilizing, that was their word, and Christianizing um, the indigenous people. So it was a, you know, in, in terms of the encounter uh, between these two parties, I think it was an extraordinary time. I would, if you know, if I could time travel, I would love to go back and just be a fly on the, on the, on the wall or, or inside the teepee or whatever to see that, because I think it would have been extraordinary. Uh, Carol has a question, um, and the, it's up to you if you'd like to answer this. Um, this is a question for Michael. Uh, Carol's wondering if Michael can respond to, to Jillian's story and to the, the issues raised within it. Sorry, I must confess I haven't read this story, <laughs> um, but I, but uh, I, um, so let me leave it out there. I haven't read the story in detail, so. Um, the next question is from Mary Leslie. Go ahead, Mary. Um, as I was reading the story, I wondered if there had been any attempt to have any formal coming together with native leaders to see if they could find any kind of mediated place to be. Was there anything that has ever been done in that regard? I see one family member stepping out of the family tradition away from his own community. I mean, there are really a lot of um, factors here, but did that, was that part of any of the discussions? Uh, to my knowledge at this point, um, the three chiefs of the Stony Nakoda First Nation have not met uh, with any of the people that are um, the force behind rebuilding the church. Um, I think attempts have been made on the part of the McDougall family to do that, but they have, there has been no meeting as far as I, as far as I know at this point. Um, uh, Tony Snow actually, who was, uh, plays a big role in the story that I wrote, um, may have something to say about that. Are you there, Tony? I'm here. Um, it's an ongoing um, involvement and the uh, the story itself, I think, um, I, I go back to your uh, 1976 story talking about the AIM occupation and, and the importance of that perspective and understanding how community dynamics work and how these involvements becoming intertwined is very important. And I think that that was kind of missed in this story. I think that there's um, issues that uh, needed more attention. And I think that from Broadview's perspective, having some indigenous people involved in the workings of, of the way you uh, develop these stories and the way that that works within uh, the church context and bringing to light some of the history. Um, the McDougall family, 
they probably won't like me saying this, but they originally came, they were originally uh, whiskey traders and they came to Christianity later on and they were brought down to the, the Morley area by my ancestors who uh, were part of the treaty signing group and the leadership group. And so they came from the uh, Wolf Creek area where there was a, a mission set up there. They brought them down to this area in safety because every, all the missionaries that came into the area were getting slaughtered by the uh, one particular group in Southern Alberta. And so the uh, issues around safety, involvement, um, working together, um, the relation to Henry Bird Steinhauer, which who was an Ojibwe uh, missionary uh, who was the one who first brought Christianity and the acceptance of Christianity to native views and kind of made that parallel for people. Uh, and his daughter, um, Abigail, who was married to John McDougall, uh, be, that led, the relationships led the way in, into how this, um, how we were brought to Christianity and, and the importance of that. So the very first Christian is remembered in the Stony language as the first Christian, and, and they were not, um, they were pacifists. The, that was a pacifist person who didn't engage in all of the, the wars and things that were going on. And so there's traditions and stories and elements that, that feed into this, that tell us how we uh, are uh, to be in relationship together. And that plays out into the treaty story, which I think is something that is very important for how we understand uh, the relationship of the church to the community and that treaty story is integral and so i think that that part got, gets missed because we don't often think about the treaties and is very um, put to the side for a lot of media and a lot of the uh, the groups that talk about that so and and uh, there was a question there about my relationship to tina fox yes we're all related we're all part of each other's families we're all part of these um connections to one another. And so uh, my father, who was the first Indigenous minister in the United Church, uh, played an important role in, in how we contextualized and brought into the, that next phase, that next movement of the Ecumenical Conference and the times that uh, Gillian was writing, very effectively understanding those dynamics that are going on at play. So um, it's, it is a very complicated issue. And I thank you for allowing me to have a few minutes to talk. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, there's a question for Jillian. Um, this is a question from Carolyn. I think it's reflective, rhetorical. Uh, had there been thoughts about an education or environment building rather than a church to build relationships? Well, um, besides the rebuilding of the church, there is a project uh, to, in fact, um, have a, um, oh, I'm, I'm missing the word here. It's an interpretive walk in the area of the church, uh, along which uh, there will be certain um, signs and explanations of the history uh, of the Stonies and the missionaries, and it will be told from the Stony point of view. Um, so that is a project that is being done. Uh, the church is, I believe, going to be rebuilt first before that project actually is completed. And I have one more question. The Stony Nakoda leadership declined to be interviewed for the story. How did that affect it? Uh, well, I very much would have wanted them to be interviewed. Uh, I think it would have added a lot more um, to the story, and I was very disappointed when they turned me down because I asked several times in several different ways. Um, but there was a lot, there was a, uh, uh, you know, a clear paper trail to follow in terms of uh, public documents, letters that they had written, all that kind of thing, which I, which was made available to me. So um, I, I felt that I had certainly had their point of view uh, down and uh, I could clearly um, report on that. But it would have been better, yes, if I'd been able to sit down with one or all of the chiefs, for sure. There's some comments from folks in the chat. Uh, a couple of resources, I think. Gail is sharing a resource from the University of Alberta called Indigenous Canada. And there is some other interesting comments about this story. 
Uh, thank you so much, Jillian and, and Tony, for, for sharing your, your insights as well. Um, that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you especially to Michael, Miranda, and Jillian, who volunteered their time for this event tonight. We're very grateful. Tomorrow, we'll send you a short survey by email so you can share your thoughts with us about the event. Please fill it out. This is still a fairly new event and we welcome any ideas you have to improve it. Broadview's online reading club is free and the costs to produce it are minimal. However, if you'd like to help Broadview continue to profile leaders like Michael Blair and feature writers like Miranda Newman and Jillian Stewart, please consider making a donation to our Friends Fund. You can go to broadview.org donate. There will also be a donations link attached to tomorrow's survey for your convenience. Broadview Reading Clubs exist across Canada. If you're interested in joining a local club or starting one of your own, please check out our information pages at broadview.org slash reading clubs. If your club isn't already listed here, please let us know so we can spread the word. After this event finishes, I invite those who are interested to remain on the call for an informal discussion time. Otherwise, thank you for being here, be well, and hope to see you back here for our next online reading club on March 1st, when we'll discuss the March issue. Good night.